Savior Lutheran Church, we're happy to have you uh, here this morning. In the sermon today, we're going to talk about things uh, of this world that are fleeting and passing away, and eternal treasures that we have in Christ, and what's important with how we look at both those things. Uh, so be on the lookout for that in all the readings this morning when you're hearing the readings read. God's blessings on your worship. Lord. 
Glad you're merciful, he is, O Lord. Be open to the prayers of your humble servants, and that they may obtain their petitions. Make them to ask such things as shall please you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Old Testament reading. With merciful, merciful you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man you show yourself blameless. With the purified you your purely. With the crooked you make yourself seem virtuous. You save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. For you can run against the truth. And by my God, I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge on him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. This is the word of the Lord. God. <clears throat> the song. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. And have done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you delight in the truth in the inward of me, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let them hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face in my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Recreate in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Jesus also said to the disciples, 
there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called to him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. This is the Gospel of our Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the Christian sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Children do this all the time. 
Young children have a hard time imagining going home to a house that they don't currently live in. That is their home, that is their house. We know that one day they will grow up and move out, but they have a hard time imagining anything else being their home. Young children do this in a variety of ways. They have a hard time imagining a time in which their parent will not be there to pick them up and hold them when they are scared, even though likewise we know that that time will one day come to an end. It is like when a child sees their school teacher in the grocery store for the first time and they are absolutely shocked and surprised because they thought their teacher lived at school. They thought that the only place their teacher could ever be was in the recess yard or in the classroom. And they see them outside the classroom and they don't understand. They have made the thing permanent in their minds because it is comfort, because it is what they know and we do the same thing. After years of dedicated service, going to the same office, the same company, week after week, day after day, it is hard to imagine being laid off in an economic downturn. We know it happens to some people, but probably not to us until it does. We do this with lots of things. It is hard to imagine, especially big things, going away. The people in your life, you grow up in the same family, with the same people around you your whole life, it's hard to imagine one of them just being taken away by a sudden illness. It happens, but it's hard to imagine. They become permanent, they become normal, they become the things we see every day. And the bigger the things are, the harder they are to imagine going away. The harder they are to imagine going away. Like the stock market, or social security. Very big things, things out of our control, things which we assume will be there, but maybe won't be there in the future. It is hard to imagine. Think about America itself as an empire, as a nation, something you've all grown up in, something you all know, a place where you all live, a place where you all call home. And it's hard to imagine America just going away one day. Sure, the land will still be here, but what about the nation? Will it still be called the same thing? Will it still look the same way as it does now? If you look at history, you can see that empires have fallen before. The nations have gone away before, but it is hard to imagine when you make it permanent in your mind. It is hard to imagine. If you've learned anything during this year, I hope that one thing you have learned is that things do go away suddenly. That things are more fleeting than you thought they might be. That a 401k can look entirely different in December 2019 than it does in March 2020. That millions of jobs can just disappear all of a sudden. That an entire nation can change its culture and its way of being seemingly overnight. Over one small crisis. Small not in the sense that it doesn't affect us in a major way. Small not in the, fact, in the sense that it's not a big deal. It is, but small in the sense that in the history of the world, there have been lots of crises, much bigger than this one. And yet this one can even change so many things. If you look at the history of the world, you'll see that. You'll see how quickly things go away. That's what the dishonest manager realizes in the parable today. He realizes how fleeting everything is. He has a job which is normal to him. He is going to his job every day which is normal to him. He is dealing with the same people he always deals with, with the same manager he always deals with, and all of a sudden it goes away. Everything in his life is scattering into a million pieces. It is fleeting. You can tell by the fact that he can even waste his manager's money that the money itself has always been fleeting. His job he loses as quickly as he got it. He realizes that his body is fleeting, it is failing because he cannot get another job with it. He realizes that his integrity could go away as quickly as he has to bear. It is all fleeting, it is all scattering into a thousand pieces. You probably know the feeling whether it's been the events of this year, 
whether it's been losing a loved one, whether it's been losing a job, whether it's been a traumatic event, a near-death experience, whatever it has been that has made something that was normal to you go away all of a sudden, it is shocking. It is surprising. It is like seeing your teacher in the grocery store, but so much worse. But that is the life of a steward. Perhaps a better translation for manager in our text today is steward. A steward is someone who manages something, who takes care of something, who stewards something on someone else's behalf. That's what the manager does for the rich man. He stewards his possessions on his behalf. And there are important parts to being a steward. The first being knowing what it is that you're stewarding. And knowing, most of all, that what it is you're stewarding is not yours. The money is not the manager's, it is the rich man's. It is his master's money. And then knowing what you have, that directs what you are going to do with it. That's the second part to being a good steward, is knowing where you're going with what, you're, what you have to steward. Knowing what you're going to do with it. The rich man thinking what, sorry, the manager thinking what he has is actually his and not his master's. He forgets it's his master's. That's why he loses his job. He wastes it. He thinks it's his to waste. He thinks it's his to own and to do with what he pleases. And then he finds out all of a sudden that it's not his and it's not his to waste. And so he has to do something else. He has to change the way he stewards. He goes all of a sudden from wasting, from doing whatever he wants, to having to focus on what's important. And what's important to him is to being able to be received into others' houses when it all goes away. What's important to him is being able to survive, to have a place to call home once all of this is gone. When you realize that the thing you have is not yours, you realize by nature that it is fleeting. Because if the master owns it and not you, the master can take it away from you. And when it is fleeting, that changes the end goal. It changes the end goal. And that's true for us too. For we have all been called to be stewards of what God has given us. For no temporal thing in this life has been given to us for our own sake, or been given to us completely without God's provision and protection and sustaining, because He is our rich master, He owns it, we don't. The jobs, the 401ks, the times, the treasures, the talents you all have, the vacations, the houses, the families, even your own bodies, they are given to you to steward by God. And when you realize that God has given them to you and that He is your master, you also realize then that He could take them away as easily as He gave them to you. That if God wills it, He could take it all away. And you've realized that. You've realized that when your body fails with years that go by, when things change with crises that come, when people are taken away from us that we don't want taken away from us, yet God in His good timing chooses when things come and when things go. God gives and He takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's part of being a steward. The end goal changes then. The end goal changes when you realize God could take everything away that you are just a humble steward. Because the end goal no longer is the thing in itself like it was for the manager at the beginning. The end goal is not the money in itself, it's not the 401k in itself, it's not the job in itself, it's even not your family in themselves or your body in itself. It is not health for health's sake, but it is health so that your body can be a living sacrifice to the Lord. It is money not for gain of wealth, but to serve the Lord with holy endeavors. It is family to serve the Lord, not family for your own enjoyment. The end goal changes. The end goal is not for the temporary things to last forever, to make things in our mind permanent, which are only ever given to be temporary, but the end goal is Christ. 
The end goal is to be with God. The end goal is to have a place to call home when this is all done. When this is all gone, when all this fails, when all this goes away, we want truly eternal dwellings. A place to call home. When it's all gone. The goal is to cry out like Job did. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And on the last day he will stand upon the earth after my skin is thus destroyed. After all of this is gone, in my flesh I will see God. The end goal is to see God and be with God, to have eternal dwellings. And that is why the dishonest manager is in fact commended. Not condemned, but commended. Commended because even though he was dishonest in doing so, he saw what was important. He saw the end goal and he went for it. He was willing to work for it. He was willing to steward his resources, his time, his talent, his treasures. He was willing to steward those things for the end goal, to have a dwelling at the end. He was able to see, this is what I have, this is what I have to do for my dwelling in the last day. And you should do that too. That is not to say that the ends justify the means. In fact, unlike the dishonest manager, we should be ethical in how we steward. And it's also not to say that if you steward well enough, then you will earn your place into heaven on the last day. That's not what he's saying. It is to say, however, that we recognize a difference between temporal things and eternal things. Between things which are fleeting and God can take away, and things which he gives eternally, which are ever important. Jesus says it very simply after this parable. If you read the paragraph after this parable, he says a lot of interesting things. One of them is you cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and your 401k. You cannot serve God and your job. You cannot serve God and your body. You have to serve God alone. There is a difference. And so steward according to serving God alone. I know it's not Stewardship Sunday yet, so maybe you'll get a repeat in a couple weeks. And I'm sorry for that. But this is our life in Christ. Our life in Christ is always one of stewardship. Our life in Christ is always one of serving God with what we have been given. So focus on what's important. Not money for money's sake. Not body for body's sake. But worship for the sake of Christ. Jesus also says in that paragraph after the parable, the one who is faithful with little will also be faithful much. The one who is faithful with little will also be faithful with much, and indeed, your rich master has not just given you little things. He has not just given you a small wealth, a small house, a small body, a little thing that could go away one day, but he has given you so much more big things, so much more eternal treasures in Christ. He has given you so many gifts, so much more to be faithful with. Things that you do not have to normalize and pretend like they are permanent, but gifts which are actually permanent and actually for your comfort. Gifts which will not go away. Gifts in His Word. Gifts in His sacrament. Gifts in His love for you. Gifts which this God delights to give His faithful. For this is the God who sent His Son to be a steward of His wrath. And as a steward of his wrath, he was shrewd in not making his wrath go upon you who have sinned against him. But he took them upon himself, canceling out, writing out, just like the manager did, writing out our debt of sin against God. He was shrewd. He was wise. And this wise Christ is the Lord. Is the Lord who will bring you with him to eternal dwellings one day is the Lord who will restore your failing flesh now to eternal flesh to stand before your Lord forever. It is this Lord, this God of whom David speaks in 2 Samuel, this God is my strong refuge. He has made my way blameless. He has made my feet like the feet of a deer to stand secure on the heights, secure in a place where there can't be moved, secure in a place where they will be forever and I cannot fall. It is this Lord, this Lord 
who has me saying, is my treasure, my life, my health, my wealth, my friend, my pleasure, my joy, my crown, my all, my bliss eternal need. And we sing one last time, what is the world to me? To God be all the honor and glory and power forever. Amen. We stand for the offering. It is truly me 
deeds right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, for Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and praise your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to Almighty God, the driver fashioned us to sight that we did. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love for one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.